So I'm going to post this as a response to uh, Fred over on his channel, Conference Report, who um, was talking about the way that religions will imagine gods, um, gods which are more or less interesting in terms of, you know, um, the way that they are uh, created by their human authors. Uh, and, you know, it would seem, of course nowadays, right, in the modern period with all of our scientific knowledge that religion and religious, religious tradition um, can somehow uh, or should somehow be explained away as either um, the product of, you know, the written word of an author, a human author, or the product of a sort of um, evolutionary evolutionarily derived or epi evolutionarily epiphenomenal um, need for a motivation, a social motivation. So biologically, in other words, in order to survive as the kind of living creatures that we are, um, or living organisms if we weren't created, at least, um, as the kind of organisms that we are, we needed to form religion um, in the past and may indeed still need to do it in some sense today, even though now we're aware of its evolutionary origins. We needed to form religion because of uh, the need for social cohesion, and unless we had a common faith, uh, we could not exist together within these complex um, patterns of law or habits of law and social order, um, what we call the political. Uh, but, you know, let, let's say that we go with this, I would agree, rather inter interesting hypothesis, the sort of secularist, scientific, modern hypothesis that religion is um, uh, a childhood necessity, but an adulthood crutch, and that to the extent that we are unable to learn to stand on our own two feet as enlightened, modern individuals, rational uh, individuals, um, you know, we remain dependent uh, on right, Mother Nature. Uh, I think it was was it Jerry Falwell, who uh, a couple decades ago, after a major hurricane, uh, you know, blamed it on disbelievers and said that if we don't believe in Father uh, Sky then we're at the mercy of Mother Earth. He hit on something deep there. Um, but Fred, in, in his video, was, was, was talking about the way that, you know, if, if he were to be a religious believer, he would probably want to invent or author more interesting gods, right, whose, whose motivations and whose capacities or powers are um, interesting engaging, uh, and that, you know, if you read this um, summary of of a novel or a play, you would actually want to read it or, or um, attend it. And I think, you know, from, from someone like Alfred North Whitehead's perspective, which is a name that I drop a lot on this channel, um, from his perspective, it, the question whether or not God exists in an ontological or metaphysical or ontotheological way is irrelevant. Um, he's more of a, a, a Jamesian pragmatist uh, in the sense that um, we don't, it doesn't so much matter, matter whether statements about God are true or God's existence are true. It's what does that stated truth do? Uh, how does it transform experience both individually and socially, um, you know, pragmatism could be understood as a kind of uh, integration or, um, you know, uh, an integration of, 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 of our philosophy and our epistemology uh, to evolutionary theory, to the fact that we are evolved beings where um, each decision that we make, you know, that let's say our brain uh, body, um, social, biological uh, entity makes has uh, consequences which ultimately 
um, <clears throat> are judged according to the death penalty, right? So without death, natural selection couldn't work. Uh, and without death, that isn't in some sense also judgment. Natural selection is not random, right? It selects for functionality, functionality ultimately having to um, pass the death penalty or the test of <clears throat> survival, but still functionality, purposefulness. So, you know, the place of purpose in, in biology and, and in evolution is really interesting because normally the secular materialist uh, will want to say that there is no at least ultimate purpose to life. Um, life was a, a chemical accident, right? Just as chemistry was a physical accident, right? And just as physics was a quantum accident, you know, of multiverse, uh, the, the becoming of multiverses, which is, itself is, what, another accident, I guess, so. Um, nothing could be on purpose. And this, I think, is where it becomes really interesting, um, where you, you step out of science and back into metaphysics, but you have the metaphysics of uh, nihilistic materialism, uh, where, uh, and atheism, where and I think there are two options. You, you know, you have someone like, let's say, Sam Harris, who from that position of nihilistic materialism will leap into um, the mystical orient uh, and, you know, Buddhist techniques of meditation, but, like, but extracted from their cultural context and purified of, of all of the sort of mythic uh, cultural um, <clears throat> support that they have in the actual cultures in which they emerged. You know, you could go. You could go Harris's route, um, which is not so much out of nihilistic materialism, but uh, into a sort of um, stoic resolve uh, about the, um, <clears throat> you know, about one's own condemnation or fate. Or you could go Richard Dawkins direction and take nihilistic materialism into um, a sort of aestheticism where it's all about beauty which is in itself purposeless and you know because it is spontaneous unexpected um, even undeserved and you know Dawkins uh, is, is clearly transfixed by his vision of the universe and and lives according to to that vision so he is a religious man in that sense or or at least i would find it uh, accurate to describe him in that way now unlike harris or or dawkins um whitehead would not want to to accept the nihilistic materialists interpretation of of the nature of the universe he would want to articulate um, a cosmology in which the cosmos is ensouled, uh, or at least if the human is to be believed uh, ensouled, um, that is, if the human is an intelligent living creature, then the universe must also be an intelligent living creature. There must be a paradigm, a cosmic paradigm for the, micro, the microcosmic example. Um, in this, he follows Plato, uh, who said something rather similar in the Timaeus. Um, Whitehead articulated a rather imaginative uh, cosmogonic drama um, and theogonic drama also. You know, God and the world for Whitehead are both uh, characters in 
the cosmic play, neither one of whom knows uh, the ending yet, but each of whom willingly participates with the other uh, in a, a, a harmony, right? Whitehead, as a cosmologist, looked at the great fact of the universe in its um, forms of harmonious unfolding through these various stages from subatomic quantum events to uh, atoms to stars and galaxies um, to chemistry and um, biology uh, and psychology and you know it's almost as though the universe were a developing organism passing through various stages of cellular differentiation into more and more um, tight, both tightly interwoven and, um, and consciously uh, awakened in, in the sense that there's both, um, you know, as Teilhard de Chardin would talk about, there's at the same time that there is increasing interconnection, there is increasing individualization or uh, as the web of connections becomes more complex, the consciousness evoked uh, within those connections, within the nodes of, of that network, um, become more intense, more alive, um, more incendiary, more uh, aflame. And... Uh, <clears throat> I think if if you if you want to understand my perspective a little bit better, it would help to read uh, this essay that I'm about to upload to the internet, so you can you can read along with me um, about Alfred North Whitehead here. That's the table of contents. <clears throat> 